Sergeant Sadowski, we're live. Thank you and good afternoon. Will sergeants please start their recording? Okay, recording started. Thank you. According to the cloud, all set. Thank you and good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. We're ready to begin. Good afternoon. I am Council Member Fernando Cabrera, Chair to the Committee on Governmental Operation. I want to start off by thanking the members of the committee joining us today. Council Members, myself, Council Member Dorma Diaz, Council Member Rodriguez. I believe that's all we have for uh, the, no, Council Member uh, Yeager and Council Member Powers. Today, the committee will be hearing two pieces of legislation. Introduction number 2257, sponsored by myself, will require the Board of Standard and Appeals, it's a known as BSA, upon issuing a decision affecting the use of a parcel land to have a copy of that decision recording in the county in which the property is located. This will ensure that the BSA's decision affecting property in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx will be available in the automatic city register information system. Decisions affecting property in Staten Island will be available in the electronic recording system maintained by the Richmond County Clerk. I'm proud to sponsor this legislation to improve government transparency. And I'm grateful to BSA Chair Marjorie Permuter, Permuter and her staff for, her, for their collaboration on this bill. Introduction number 2313, sponsored by Council Member Donis Rodriguez, will create an Office of Ethnic and Community Media in place certain requirements on agency advertising spending. New York City is home to more than 3 million immigrants, and more than one in five New Yorkers is considered limited English proficient. The last seven years, multilingual campaigns conducted by the city have become the norm. We saw this with the initial ID, IDNYC rollout and mostly recently in the city's census campaign and COVID-19 rapid response in 2020. In 20, 2019, the mayor signed Executive Order 47, which directed city agencies to spend at least half of their advertising budgets on ethnic and community media outlets. Fiscal year 2020, the city spent $9.9 .9 million, or 84% of its total advertising dollars in this type of media outlet. This is a dramatic improvement from only 18% spent on community media advertising in 2013. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown all of us the vital importance of ensuring that diverse communities receive timely and accurate information from the city in their preferred language. It is undeniable that the trustee, that the trusted messengers such as ethnic and community media outlets are able to speak to the hard to reach community that mainstream media outlets who primarily print in English. The mayor's executive order 47 is widely seen as a resounding success and both city government and community media publishers have seen, it, have seen the benefit of reaching New Yorkers through media they trust and engage with. Introduction 2313 will codify Executive Order 47 and guarantee that the commitment the city has made to advertising ethnic and community media outlets is maintained and strengthened in the coming years. I want to thank Councilmember Rodriguez for being an advocate for immigrants and limited English proficient community in his district across our city. And I commend him this legislation. I want to thank the Board of Standard and Appeals the mayor's office of operation for being here today. I look forward to the testimony. And as always, I'd like to thank the dream team committee staff that we have, CJ Murray, Emily Fort John, Elizabeth Cron, Sebastian Bacci, and the central staff operating this remote hearing behind the scenes. And I also wanna thank my own legislative director, Clark Pena for making this hearing possible. I will now turn it over to my colleague, council member 
Rodriguez to say a few words about his bill. Thank you, Chairman Cabrera, for your leadership on these bills and in many other bills, not only the Great Board or the Bronze, where you've been a champion, but also in the whole city of New York, especially looking to protect working class and middle class New York. I know that not only my bills, but your bill is very important for you. I know that you have lived the experience working with so many agony and community media in the whole borough of the Bronx, also in the city of New York. You've been working with them, uh, agony media from the Asian community, from Bangladesh, from other groups that you have in the boroughs. Also, you've been a, a leaders also working with the, with the Latino agony uh, uh, media that we have as also working with all the ethnic community media for the Jewish community that also had their own newspaper from the Afro-American communities. And for, the, for a, everyone who understand that many New Yorkers uh, are living today like myself. When I came here, I used to wash dishes without speaking the language. And, and however, I contribute from 83 to 2000. And when I live with green card, at the same level as I've been contributing after being a teacher, after being elected official. So, you know, this bill that will allow the city of New York to expand on the executive order that the mayor, Mayor de Blasio established uh, before COVID. Now we have a great opportunity to work together with Mayor de Blasio, his team, Paulo Chor, Emma Wolf, and from the speaker, Corey Johnson, Jason Goldman, and James, and everyone, you know, that really want to a, a work on this hearing to work together to pass this bill so that that we will have an office with a director, with a, a, a person in charge of marketing to be sure that if we are saying that 50% of the investment of all those millions of dollars that we invest at the city of York to media should go to the any community media. It should go to programs such as a Nazario, such as a, a, a Cesar Romero, you should go to Manuel Ruiz, those people and other in the Creole who speak Creole, who speak Cantonese, who speak also other language in the city of New York, who have an audience who have been paying their taxes. And however, they have not been able to get the city to put millions of dollars as they've been doing to the mainstream media. And we've been working together, not only again with you in this bill, but also I've been working together with Brooklyn Board President Eric Adams, who is also a co-prime, as also as is a, a co-prime, a, a speaker, Corey Johnson, as also is a co-prime, also our Felix. And we working together will be see this office being created. As we all know very well, our city is among one of the most diverse in the world. Our meeting path, melting path communities consist of over 200 different language across the five boroughs with people from all over the globe. I think that as we will, as we are looking for, you know, how to expand, there's a lot that we have to do. Unfortunately, during the height of the pandemic, we saw that many of these immigrants, low income communities, where all communities were also the ones who were hit hardest, the hardest by COVID-19. When many upper class New Yorkers left to the Hobson Valley, left to the, to the home turn, working class New Yorkers who read the newspaper, who follow the blog, who follow the TV, the local any community TV program, they didn't get see the city investing their dollar on COVID-19, on, on any other uh, millions of dollars that the city being investing. I think that it is time again for our city to give the respect to all New Yorkers especially those 35% of New Yorkers who, are in, who are, have been born and raised in another country. Intro 2313, which I work closely with Speaker Corey Johnson, Brooklyn Board President Eric Adams, would establish, and uh, also Felix, would establish the mayor's office of agni and community media. Our goal is to ensure we are not excluding our agni and local media outlets. They have the potential to play a key role in sharing information with communities of all backgrounds across the city. According to the Central Community for Community Media, CUNY's 
Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism, there are over 300 ethnic and local media in New York City. And of course, I have some concern on how CUNY, it, it, some people related to CUNY, published an article in the last couple of weeks without giving credit to what is already in plan to create this office. It is crucial that we support our local media outlets and work with them to share important information. Many Spanish speaking media outlets as other ethnic media receive significantly less or nothing on funding from the city's total advertising spending, even though they make up over 28% of the total city population and contribute millions of dollars in taxes. It is time for us to work on this bill. You will hear from different publishers on the ethnic community media and together we will pass it. Nosotros hoy estamos aquí agradeciéndole al presidente de este comité que ha sido un líder en el Bronx en este tema y en otros, asegurándonos que pasemos un proyecto de ley apoyado por el speaker Kobe Johnson, apoyado por el presidente del condado Eric Adams, que va a crear la oficina de, mi, de prensa étnica y comunitaria que va a garantizar que por primera vez la ciudad de Nueva York invierta millones de dólares en todos los periódicos, en todos los programas de televisión, en todos los blogs que nosotros tenemos. Juntos vamos a pasar este proyecto de ley. Gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Rodriguez. I will now turn it over to our moderator, Elizabeth Kronk, to go over some of the procedural items. And let me just recognize we've also been joined by Councilmember Perkins. Thank you, Chair Guevara. I am Elizabeth Kronk, Senior Policy Analyst to the Immigration Committee on Governmental, sorry, to the Committee on Governmental Operations. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony and to respond to council member questions today will be representatives from the Board of Standards and Appeals, or BSA. After Chair Cabrera and council members have had an opportunity to ask questions of the BSA on introduction 2257, I will call the second panel from Mayor's Office of Operations to give testimony on introduction number 2313. From the BSA, we are joined by BSA Chair Marjorie Perlmutter and BSA General Counsel Kurt Steinhaus. From the Mayor's Office of Operations, we are joined by Chief of Staff Brady Hamed and Senior Advisor Joshua Sivis. Panelists, I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your question. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the committee chair. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Chair Perlmutter, General Counsel Steinhaus, Chief of Staff Hamid, and Senior Advisor Sidis, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath once and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? BSA Chair Parmater. I so affirm. BSA General Counsel Steinhaus. I do. Mayor's Office of Operations Chief of Staff Hamid. I do. Mayor's Office of Operations Senior Advisor Sidibs. I do. Thank you. Chair Perlmutter, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the Governmental Operations Committee. I am Marjorie Perlmutter, Chair of the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, the Board of Standards and Appeals supports introduction number 2257, which would require the board to record in the office of the city register or the Richmond County Clerk's Office notice of each of its orders, requirements, decisions, determinations, resolutions, or restrictive declarations. 
First, I would like to provide a brief background on the Board of Standards and Appeals, as well as the reasons for our support, and then take questions. Since 1916, the board has worked to administer zoning, building, and housing regulations in a fair and just manner to protect the city's interest in safeguarding the general welfare while balancing private property interests. In this role, the board has frequently be called a, quote, relief valve, a protector of the city's regulations from constitutional challenge and a guardian of the urban fabric. The board is an independent agency that consists of five full-time commissioners with select skill sets, including experience in architecture, urban planning, and engineering, supported by a staff of 16 employees. Using their technical expertise and independent judgment, each commissioner scrutinizes every land use application with the utmost of care. Commissioner's review frequently involves analyzing intricate construction documents, financial statements, testimony from other government agencies, and site conditions gleaned through visits to the properties and neighborhoods at issue. The board staff of uh, 16 to 18 employees currently manages 105 years of archives and pending applications currently in review. Under the direction of the board's executive director and deputy director, these applications are reviewed by four project managers and one director of environmental review. Second, as I mentioned, we support introduction number 2257, Variances, special permits, and other applications granted by the Board of Standards and Appeals employ safeguards and conditions to ensure that its decisions minimize any potential adverse effects on surrounding communities. The Board's waivers of zoning and other regulations and conditions of approval are delineated in a set of Board-approved architectural plans and in a written resolution, copies of which are retained by the applicant forwarded to the Department of Buildings and maintained in the board's archives. However, the board has seen numerous occasions where the property owner, neighbors and government agencies are actually unaware that a property is subject to board jurisdiction. Frequently, a new owner will learn for the first time in perhaps a decade or more that the property is subject to a variance or a special permit upon receiving a violation for a zoning non-compliance because due diligence searches conducted prior to purchasing did not flag these property restrictions. Accordingly, the board should record its resolutions against the properties they affect in the office of the city register or the Richmond County clerk to ensure they become part of the title search process and to provide clarity to the public at large. This modest operational modification would greatly benefit property owners subject to board jurisdiction, the vast majority of which are small businesses, homeowners, and nonprofit organizations. But it would also help ensure that the board's safeguards and conditions are carried out, lowering enforcement costs and benefiting communities. I'm happy to take any questions and look forward to hearing ideas about improving the board's processes. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. I want to recognize we also being joined by Council Member Kalos. I, I only have uh, four brief questions. Uh, I think this bill is uh, uh, very helpful and very straight up. But uh, I wanted to ask you what resources will be necessary uh, for the board to submit decisions for publications in the appropriate public register? So um, there, it's actually no additional resources necessary. The board actually only decide, comes to a decision on maybe, let's just to throw out a, uh, an estimate, ten, say 10 cases a month. So that's about 10 at, at most 20 cases that where there would be a resolution that would be, need to be recorded. Those are recorded on the city's ACRIS and on the uh, Staten Island City Clerk's Office um, digitally. And so it's easily done by a staff member who is already working on these resolutions. Fantastic. Is it the committee's understanding that currently a property owner may not know their parcel of land is subject to a BSA decision into a violation is issued? Can you share how the BSA handles such a situation? 
Is the property owner held liable or are there opportunities to rectify the issue? So what happens is um, the Department of Buildings issues the violation and it may, for example, the most common of which is our gas stations. Almost every gas station in New York City has received a variance or a special permit in its, in its existence in order to be able to operate. Many property owners are not aware that it was a BSA decision to allow that. And they're, for example, located in residence districts. So somehow or other, Department of Buildings finds out and issues a violation for which, yes, there, there are penalties associated with it. And that's the first time where the property owner will now learn that they have to come to the BSA to rectify it. So the BSA is not involved in the Department of Buildings violations process. That's for DOB to deal with. But we uh, accept these um, applications and work with the applicant to rectify the situation and extend the term of the special permit or variance as long as they can establish that they are still entitled to those waivers. Thank you. I have two more questions, uh, but I see uh, Councilman Yeager, he has a question and then I'll, I'll come right back. Okay. Councilman Yeager. Time starts now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Madam. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Does the Board of Standards and Appeals currently have no legal authority to record its decisions with the county clerk in Richmond and the city register and the other four boroughs? I'm going to actually defer to my general counsel, Kurt Steinhaus, on this one, if that's okay with you, Kurt. Uh, yes, that's our understanding that this legislation would be necessary in order to codify um, the operations of recording BSA resolutions. Um, as you would note, um, the Landmarks Preservation Commission has a specific provision in the administrative code that's analogous. Okay. Uh, do you maintain a list of properties at your agency that have had a BSA decision uh, rendered with respect to it by address? Okay. Yes. So, if a yes. title, so if a title company was to uh, do a, a diligent title search for a property, they could simply, as part of that process, request the board to check its records. If one center street has any decisions rendered with respect to it, then you'd give them an answer in a day or two. So it, it actually goes like this. I have quite a lot of experience from my prior work life with title companies. The typical title company does not delve into Board of Standards and Appeals or City Planning or Landmarks Preservation Commission decisions. They go to the Department of Finance and they look to see what's there and download that data. They go to the Department of Buildings to see if there are violations. They go to judgments to see if there are judgments. And then that's that. It's only very, very savvy uh, council who might Think to check at the other agencies whether is there is something that's indicating um, a BSA or city planning or I, land types. I appreciate all that, but that's the answer to a question if I would have asked, are title companies necessarily always good at what they do uh, or do they commit malpractice from time to time? But the question <laughs> that I asked is whether or not you maintain this list and if a title company chose to make a search, would they be able to ask? And specifically, I'm um, referring to your answer that you gave before, uh, for example, a gas station. Um, you know, if somebody is going to purchase something and a title company then, or actually you referred to this in your testimony, you, you mentioned people don't know uh, what, what is affecting their property until after they purchase it. Well, then they have a claim against their title company. They, they, the title company certified clear, free and clear title uh, without referring to a uh, necessary encumbrance on the title, which is your decision. So they didn't do their job. I'm just trying to see, you know, I find frequently here in this body, we pass laws that are solutions in search of problems. And, you know, I, I try to err on the side of that. Um, the city, the city has operated quite well uh, without us stepping, our, stepping ourselves in the middle of things and passing laws all the time. The only reason that we pass laws is because the charter requires us to meet twice a month. So I'm trying to figure out precisely what it is that this law uh, is, why this law is necessary, I haven't been able to see from the committee report or from the sponsor's opening statement why it's necessary. I understand why it's not an entirely bad idea, 
just don't see why it's necessary. And okay. I still haven't heard why it's necessary. I'm so, not saying, it's your, Madam Chair, I'm not saying it's your job uh, to try to tell us why it's necessary. But if you can, that would be great because you've been chair for a while and you've never come before the council and said, you know, it would be great if you guys passed this law. Ah, so, okay. So step one. Yes, of course, we maintain records. Anyone who has the uh, let's say general knowledge about how the city operates and is, uh, let's say, uh, broadly versed enough can check on not only that on our website to see whether you can just put in the uh, property's address or block and lot number into our website and our resolutions are recorded back to, I think it's 1989, is that correct? Yeah, 90. So, uh, so, but anything that was decided before that, that might have been in a state of incredible lapse, they would have to call our archive department and find out about that. So yes, of course, we maintain records. We're also required um, by, actually, it's, uh, I think, legislation under uh, Council Member Kalos to have a do it search. So there's the general database shows the existence of BSA cases on a map, um, again, but only back to 1990, I believe, right? So it's only 1998. 1998, yes. thank you. So there's only so much of a sweep that the database can do. Um, Time expired. Sorry, does that mean we're done? No, you can keep talking. Okay. <laughs> um, but in terms of the necessity for this, I've been actually, so <laughs> just a little bit of background. Um, I had this whiteboard installed in my office when I first became chair. And one of the first things on the whiteboard was to require the recording of BSA resolutions. And it took us up to this point um, to get up to that, right? So we've been talking with the law department and so on for a long time about this. And um, this was, I would have to say, uh, maybe COVID gave us the opportunity to focus on this a, a, a little bit more, but it's been an essential uh, ingredient for the BSA for a long time. And um, for example, Landmarks Commission, the Landmarks Commission records all of its, uh, its uh, designations against the property. So there's no such thing as a person with a Landmarks designated property who's not aware of it as a result of a simple title search where all you do is go on ACRIS and you find out. Um, so, and you know, the sad news is title searches are not as complete as you would like and are they committing malpractice? Um, that's for an ethics committee to decide. We're trying to help the property owner um, save a lot of money in violations, a lot of heartache um, to be aware that they should be coming regularly for renewals. Uh, so we think this is actually essential and um, will really save small businesses um, from, from needless expense. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Yeager. And I don't recall if I recognize already Councilmember Kalos. Uh, I don't see another question by uh, any other colleagues. So let me continue with my last two. Uh, the bill allows for the BSA to post record of its decisions prior to the effective day of the bill, a quote, where it determines to be in the public interest, uh, end quote. What types of past decision, if any, does the board anticipate posting? Approximately how long would it take? And what resources the board anticipate needing for this task? Thank you. So. Obviously, it's easier if we move forward with what we have in hand and record it as we go along. But once we learn how to effectively mount these decisions, our intention is to slowly work our way back to about 10 years so that all decisions in the last 10 years are eventually recorded against the property. Because 10 years tends to be um, the sort of effective uh, application of the BSA on properties. Before that, likely either they've been um, amended in the past or abandoned or something like that. So 10 years seems to be kind of the general, generally agreed uh, time frame. And in terms of resources, no additional resources, as I said earlier. Great. 
Uh, and just for the record, does intro 2257 as drafted provide the BSA with a sufficient authority to notice its decision in all publicly available databases typically used by property owner? Does the board intend to post decisions in additional places not provided for in the bill? Uh, Kurt, can we take that maybe? Sure. Um, so as drafted, we feel that this gives sufficient authority for the board to post its decisions um, in ACRES and the Richmond County Clerk's Office. Um, and uh, that is the current state of um, our policy goals right now. Okay, great. Uh, moderator, do we have anyone else? Um, I don't see any hands raised. I'm not seeing, um, but I can go ahead and give some instructions. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. Uh, I will now call on council members in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you would like to ask a question at this time and you have not raised your hand, please do so now. You will have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer. We'll let you know when your time is up. Since I've called on you, please wait until the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your question. Seeing no hands raised right now, I think we can, um, I'll turn it back to you, Chair. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and to your staff. Thank you. Thank you for the great work that you continue to do. Uh, when I look at all of you put together the years of, of experience, uh, it, it just, you continue to do the robust work that is required uh, from the BSA. You, you literally filled the gap, uh, mm -hmm. which um, uh, I'm very proud of the work that you, you all have done. So thank you so much. And with that, I'll turn it back to the moderator for our next part of the hearing. Thank you. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. I will now call on our second panel from the administration to give testimony on introduction number 2313. Mr. Hamed, uh, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Speaker Corey Johnson, Chairman Fernando Cabrera, and members of the Government Operations Committee and Council Members Idanas Rodriguez and Oswald Faliz for co-sponsoring this legislation. Thank you for inviting us to appear before you today to discuss community and ethnic media and introduction 2313. My name is Brady Hammond and I am the Deputy Director of Accountability and Administration for the Mayor's Office of Operations. I'd also like to recognize Jose Bayona, Director of Community and Ethnic Media at the Mayor's Press Office for his leadership and organizing role in this important effort. On May 22nd, 2019, Mayor Bill de Blasio signed Executive Order 47 strengthening our commitment to community and ethnic media. This executive order directs all city agencies, the New York City Department of Education, New York City Health and Hospitals, and the New York City Housing Authority to spend at least 50% of their eligible individual, annual, print and digital advertising budgets with the city's community and ethnic media outlets starting in fiscal 2020. This commitment to community and ethnic media advertising spending is important not only to amplify city services to communities and neighborhoods that may have limited English proficiency or otherwise may be unaware of city government programs, but also to support New York City's small businesses and community and ethnic media news outlets, an effort that has been particularly important during the COVID-19 pandemic. There is a broad landscape of city agencies, offices, and partners that are instrumental in placing advertisements in community and ethnic media outlets citywide. Jose Bayona, Director of Community and Ethnic Media for the Mayor's Press Office, serves in a leadership role for this work. This role is foundational as a primary liaison with the community and ethnic media outlet partners and assisting agencies in developing advertising campaigns. This role is also important in maintaining the community and ethnic media directory posted publicly on the city's websites. The Mayor's Office of Operations is tasked with implementing the requirements of Executive Order 47. The Office of Operations is focused on the performance management aspect of the city agency's media advertising spending, working with the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics on analyzing the relevant data, issuing guidance documents, and hosting trainings with agencies to support their compliance with the executive order, 
collecting data in a quarterly cadence, and checking in with agencies to support them in meeting the 50% advertising spending target. The Office of Operations also reviews and approves agency requests for exemptions, petitions, and waivers on certain requirements as outlined in the executive order. Additionally, the Office of Operations reports on the data publicly each fiscal year. The Department of Citywide Administrative Services hosts a backdrop contract with two advertising firms, Miller and Greystone. These firms are provided with training and guidance on the requirements of the Executive Order 47. They help agencies place advertisements in community and ethnic media outlets and also regularly report advertising spending data to the Office of Operations. Finally, each agency has its own network of marketing and fiscal contacts that work to reach the 50% advertising spending target for the agency. For the purposes of Executive Order 47, community and ethnic media outlets are defined as a print or digital outlet that is created for the communities of people based on native language, race, color, gender, national origin, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, disability, or immigrant status, targets a discrete neighborhood or geographic region, or populations that may or may not typically receive information from mainstream publications because of their exclusive use of foreign language, or falls within specifically tailored subject matter. To calculate agencies' spending toward the 50% advertising spend goal, the Office of Operations collects all ad spending data, both for mainstream and community and ethnic media print and digital outlets. Collecting the full universe of print and digital advertising spend allows us to calculate how each agency is meeting the 50% community and ethnic media advertising spend goal. At this time, other forms of media, including social media, broadcast media like television and radio, mobile applications unaffiliated with a print and digital outlet, job boards, professional associations or networks, bus shelter ads, and other types of media are outside the scope of the executive order and are therefore excluded from the calculations. The Office of Operations regularly collects data on individual advertisement placements, both from agencies and directly from Miller and Greystone, the advertising firms mentioned previously. Operations collects all advertisement data on a quarterly basis in order to perform regular benchmarking with agencies throughout the year in an effort to meet the 50% advertising spending targets. Throughout the fiscal year, the Director of Community and Ethnic Media and the Office of Operations partner to maintain the Community and Ethnic Media Directory and work with agencies to reach a broad network of the outlets. There is also a regular process for communicating with agencies to review annual waivers for agencies with a negligible advertising spend, petitions for agencies to request for spending with an outlet that would typically be out of scope from compliance calculations to count positively toward community and ethnic media spending, and exemptions for a request for spend that typically counts negatively for compliance to be excluded from cal compliance calculations entirely, generally requested if the agency places ads in a mainstream outlet in order to meet other legal requirements. At the end of, e uh, at the, end of the fiscal year, operations compiles this data and publishes it on its website and on the open data portal. Operations also has a partnership in place with the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism, CUNY Foundation, on behalf of the Center for Community Media at CUNY to further support the joint commitment to community and ethnic media. In addition to the 2020 summary report published by the CUNY Center for Community Media, which utilizes data provided by the Mayor's Office of Operations, the city also works with the CUNY Center for Community Media to ensure lines of communication are open between outlets and key city agency marketing and press staff. The city has demonstrated strong progress in fulfilling the goals of Executive Order 47 and advertising city services to a diverse group of communities. In fiscal 2020, the first full fiscal year of the executive order, the city saw substantial spending on community and ethnic media outlets. 35 out of 40 eligible agencies, or 88% of agencies, met the 50% spending threshold citywide 9.9 .9 million out of the $11.8 million of eligible advertising spending was spent on community and ethnic media outlets. This represented 84% of spending, far outpacing the stated 50% goal. Compliance at both an individual agency and at citywide levels far surpassed our targets. The city was also able to communicate its programs and services with individuals who read community and ethnic media outlets and support those outlets in the process. 
This targeted communication was particularly important during the COVID-19 pandemic, as many community-based outlets served as key news sources for communities vulnerable to COVID-19. Moreover, in fiscal 2020, the city placed ads with 50 outlets for the first time ever and increased advertising placements with more than 185 outlets. The city is commu committed to continuing this important push in future fiscal years. The mayor's office of operations and the city are largely supportive of introduction 2313 to create an office of ethnic and community media, which aligns with the values, goals, and accomplishments of the de Blasio administration in advertising critical city services to a diverse landscape of communities, including those with limited English proficiency. I'd like to close by thanking our external partners at the CUNY Center for Community Media for their guidance and support on this important initiative, and by thanking you, council members, for your leadership on this topic and hearing our testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I want to take a moment, a moment to thank the mayor and to all the staff that made it possible for Executive Order 47 to take place, because truly, we had an injustice taking place, institutional injustice uh, into the executive order uh, came into being. Uh, I wanted to ask, I have a few questions here and then I'll turn it to uh, my colleagues. I know the sponsor of the bill, uh, we're seeking to codify uh, the executive order uh, through, through this bill. But I wanted to ask you, you know, I just, Maybe I didn't get it right. Are there some agencies that did not meet the 50% threshold? Uh, that is correct. Uh, 35 out of the 40 agencies did meet the 50% spending threshold, which means uh, in fiscal year 2020, five agencies that are participating did not meet the spending threshold. And there's a particular reason why they didn't? Uh, there's a variety of reasons for each of those agencies. Um, we do regular benchmarking with all of the agencies to make sure that they are reaching those goals. And so when we see that an agency is not reaching the 50% advertising spending goal, we partner with uh, the director of community and ethnic media and the agency to help get them on the right track. Um, for a couple of the agencies that, that did not meet the goal, they have relatively small um, advertising budgets for fiscal year 2020. Um, so just did not have um, much of an opportunity to correct that along the way in the fiscal year. Would it have helped if you would have gotten them more funding? So then it, we could have an equitable uh, disbursement of that, those funding towards media? I can't speak to every agency's advertising budget, but I can say that it would definitely help to have more advertising budget for each of the agencies. Um, how do you know that these ads are actually, is there like an accountability system uh, to making sure, I know you, you get a, a run of listing when the spots are put on, but is there someone that just do sporadic checks to making sure that they're actually being put on a certain time and in those uh, channels? Uh Thank you for the question, council member. At this time, we don't have kind of a, a formal audit process um, to make sure that all of the agencies are placing those ads. However, what we do is we collect data from both our advertising firm, Miller and Greystone, and from the agency, and we are able to um, double check that data. And whenever there are uh, discrepancies in the data, uh, we uh, frequently do desk research and do look up some of those advertisements, um, especially ones in question that you, that you reference. Does, does those consulting companies check uh, to see if they actually got put on? And the reason I'm asking, I, I've seen it in at times uh, that people put commercials that went to check those times and actually was not put on by the TV station. So I just wanna make sure that we get what we're paying for. Yeah, I, I don't know um, what their kind of double checking process is. I'll look into it and get back to you. Okay. Um, intro 2313 gives the, the mayor discretion on where to house the new office of ethnic and community media. Where would this office be housed? I think we support the legislation as written that allows it to be um, housed uh, in an office at discretion of the mayor. I think there's any number of um, appropriate 
uh, organizations for the office to be housed in. It, but for this year, I mean, the mayor will have a say where it will go, right? Um, sure. Uh, currently, um, Jose Bayona, the director of community and ethnic media, um, works for uh, City Hall uh, and the mayor's press office. Um, and the mayor's office of operations supports the kind of performance management and data collection uh, of those efforts. Um, so I think having a report directly into City Hall um, as uh, the current director does uh, would be appropriate. How many staff do you anticipate you're gonna need? And do you anticipate you use an existing staff or hire new staff? And at what cost? Um, we haven't yet had the opportunity to think through all of the operational elements of this. Right now, the administration of Executive Order 47, um, including the, the funding for Jose Bayona's role, the Director of Community and Ethnic Media, the staff at the Mayor's Office of Operations, um, and the staff at agencies who are working on marketing contacts are already budgeted. Um, so we do not expect a, a significant budget need uh, to administer the new Office of Ethnic and Community Media. Okay, great. Executive Order 47 on 2019 required the mayor's office to develop and maintain approved lists of community and ethnic media outlets for city agencies to use at the discretion for placing ads. The list, as you know, posted on the city open data portal includes 233 outlets. Meanwhile, the list posted on the mayor's office of media and entertainment website includes 283 outlets. Can, can you share with us uh, which one's the correct number they, uh, pursuant to EO 47? And why do the open data in MOM have two different lists? Uh, that's a good question. I'd have to look into that um, discrepancy specifically. Um, but uh, we do update the list with the Mayor's Office of Media Entertainment regularly. Um, and that is an accurate list of 283 outlets. That's 50, that's, that's a substantial, uh, you think someone just forgot to post them up or? Uh, we prioritize uh, updating it with uh, the Mayor's Office of Media Entertainment website. We know that's where um, most people are accessing this data. Um, and so, yes, there's likely a lag of our office updating uh, the directory on the open data portal. And uh, as you may know, CUNY Newmark, uh, J School Center for Community Media has also reported that they are working with the mayor's office to consolidate their list of 300 plus outlets with the mayor's list. When would this list be consolidated? We are in regular contact with the Center of Community and Media and we uh, have exchanged um, notes on um, many of the outlets that are not yet on our directory. Um, we are continuing to look at those outlets um, and uh, determine whether or not they're appropriate for our directory. Um, we will likely be updating it sometime in the next coming months. Coming months, like two months, five months? Uh, probably by the end of the summer. By the end of the summer, that's great. Uh, what criteria do you use uh, and who ultimately makes the decision, but very interested in knowing the criteria for determining which outlets uh, get the funding and, and how do you measure success? That's a great question. Um, I think uh, ultimately uh, this is um, the responsibility of Jose Bayona, the director of community and ethnic media um, he is responsible for determining which outlets are on the community and ethnic media directory. Um, we are always evaluating um, which agencies are spending with new outlets that have not yet been spent or included on our directory. Um, and when we do find that there is spending with those outlets that are appropriate to be included, um, we add them to our directory and our compliance calculations. Yeah, but do you, when I talk about criteria, do you have like a rubric that you use? How do, how do we know that it is going to the right, right outlets? Like, look, during COVID-19, I saw in certain channels, uh, very few and some of them, no advertisement at all from the city. So I, and I'm talking about the ethnic media and 
I'm just curious, the person who's sitting behind the desk, they say, oh, you know, we, we're gonna go this way, we're gonna go this way. Is there a rubric that says, this is what we need to do and this is why? Yeah, uh, in general, in order to make our directory, um, community and ethnic media outlets have to meet um, the definition that we described earlier. They have to focus on a specific um, race, demographic breakdown, um, neighborhood. Um, and that's what they get onto our directory and we prefer if the outlets are based in New York City. Um, the agencies have discretion over which outlets their advertisements are placed in. And if they are working with Miller and Greystone, there is expertise there on making sure that um, those advertisements are placed in a um, variety of outlets, um, including those that the agency may be trying to target with a given program. Um, so operations is only managing the, the data collection compliance at large. Each of the agencies uh, directs the spending of their own advertising budget. You know, I started uh, by complimenting, and I'll continue to do that uh, for this executive order. It, it really uh, brought, you know, we're in the right direction and bringing balance. Uh, but you, you'll hear from some of the reporters that I see here uh, from some, uh, some outlets here uh, that I, I happen to know personally, <clears throat> uh, for example, in Dominican media, that uh, they have felt that they uh, were largely ignored this last year in terms of, of getting uh, some of those fundings to go through the, those programming uh, because they reach a certain sector of society that to be honest with you, nobody else is. Uh, and, and that could be a different, you know, uh, we, we could go around in different sectors. So I, I will hope that we will have a, a better way that is more objective uh, to be able to make these selection, selections so we could give a better answer on why someone selected, someone or not uh, in the future. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to our wonderful moderator. Uh, I know there's some council members that have some questions and I come back uh, for my final questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. Um, I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question, you would not raise your hand, please do so now. Uh, you will have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Once I have called on you, please wait until the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your question. We will first hear from Council Member Rodriguez before hearing from Council Member Yeager. Time starts now. It's difficult to be sitting here and listening to, you know, all the great things that have been happening, placing art and spending in all the ethnic community media when you represent a district, in my case in Northern Manhattan, that none of the any media have been able to get uh, any investment. And in the list of participants, you were here, another translator, they would do the job. So many of them, but the city has never approached them and say, we respect your contribution. We want to invest on you guys so that you are also available to connect your readers, your audience to the services. You know, our people pay taxes. They can speak different language, but they work in Delhi. They work in supermarket. They work in bodega. They're raising their family. I, I'm happy to see some of the publisher, but I also would like to you know, hear from you, what is the process on how those two that you mentioned and Miller and the other were used to select them as the one that we rely on for them to go out and connect the services with the agni community media? How many have they gone to Northern Manhattan to the South Bronx, 
go and meet with the Jewish community, with the Asian community, and check where are those local newspapers here. So, of course, my daughter, eight and 14, I cannot promise them that either they grandchildren, we believe in a society of equal opportunity because we have inherited a culture where this is all about who control the resources. And I think, however, we will continue moving forward. I'm happy to be working with the mayor. And I know that his executive order, um, except, you know, move our city in the right direction, but it's not enough. When I read the article in the New York Times from CUNY, I mean, for me, this was about, the, were CUNY aware? Did CUNY know that without, there was a bill already introduced to create this office? Have they approached and tried to figure out what, is, what was the plan of expanding it? What is Miller doing? What is the other publisher doing to connect with the local ethnic media regardless if they are Latino, if they're Asian, if they're Jewish, if they're Anglo. They have been a group of people that for decades they've been using, they've been controlling those advertising. And we, not, we had to break that wall. Nosotros tenemos que entender de que aquellos de ustedes que tienen un medio, un periódico, un programa de televisión el cable de media hora, un blog, Ustedes tienen una audiencia de personas que pagan impuestos. Cuando hablen ahorita, no dejen ninguno de ustedes de hablar. Hablen en español, hablen en creole, hablen en el idioma que ustedes sea más fácil y que se le traduzcan. Y compartan la experiencia de ustedes, los años que ustedes tienen, el servicio que ustedes hagan. Y demanden de que la ciudad, con la oficina de Ethnic Community Media, lo incluya ustedes también cuando se hacen toda la campaña the UPK, the COVID, the No Fumar, the Salud, the, the Vision Zero. So I, I'm happy again, and I want to thank Paulo Choa, Emma Wolf, you know, Jason Goldman, a speaker, Eric Adams, we're working together with this bill since day one. A lot of respect from Jose Bayona. But when you mention Jose Bayona 20 times, I mean, it's about, okay. So is he so empowered? Does he control all those resources? And, and I definitely trust and believe in the leadership of Seba Jonah. But I do believe that this office should definitely bring the necessary changes. Cannot be a two main publisher that control for decades where we publish those ads. So I'm happy, uh, but I, I know so a little bit frustrated on how we got here. And I hope again that this office we play a major role, millions and millions of dollars. I chair the committee of transportation. I can tell you how many dollars the DOT has invested in the public media, in the public newspaper TV in my community. No, I know how much? Zero. That's unacceptable. Thank you, Thank you so much, council member. Any other uh, council members? I'm not seeing any hands right now. We had council member Yeager on deck. Not sure if he's no longer here. Um, so I'm going to go back to you. Sure. Thank you so much. Let me come back to a couple of more questions. The Office of Ethnic and, and Community Media will be required to provide at least one annual training for city agent, agency employees responsible for advertising. Will this training be developed by the office or an external organization? What will this training involve? Will this training have a cost? And if so, how much? Uh, thank you. And I do just want to uh, respond to say thank you to Councilmember Rodriguez for your, your comments. Um, I do think that the creation of this uh, Office of Ethnic and Community Media uh, is going to be helpful in accomplishing those goals. Um, to speak to training specifically, um, the city has conducted um, two trainings so far with the agencies um, since the creation of the executive order um, and has been involved in uh, how to use the directory, compliance with reporting the data, and showcasing some of our more successful agency partners and how they've been developing ad campaigns. 
Um, while I uh, imagine that this training would be uh, developed at the discretion of the future Office of Ethnic and Community Media, um, and we don't have it yet fully thought through it operationally, um, there is a path forward to doing it um, within city government. As you know, the bill will require city agencies to spend at least 50% of their advertising budget in ethnic and community media, but it will allow the Office of Ethnic and Community Media to grant waivers from this requirement. For what reasons do you anticipate a waiver um, might be granted, aside from the need for certain notices to be posted in certain places pursuant to city and state law? Uh that is the, the primary reason that we have granted waivers in the past. I would say the overwhelming majority of them are for legal requirements. Got it. Uh, what contracts does the city currently have with, uh, with an ad placement firms? What types of advertisement are they each responsible for? And what is the time frame for the current contracts? Sorry, what was the question again? Sure. What contracts does the city currently have with the, with the ad placement firms, the two firms? What types of advertise, advertising are they each responsible for? And what is the time frame for the current contracts? Um, I'd have to get back to you on a couple of specifics, but there are the two backdrop contracts with um, both Miller and Greystone. Um, they both work. Um, across uh, all types of media landscape for the purposes of Executive Order 47. Um, we are tracking only um, print and digital uh, compliance spend, but the agencies do work with those advertising firms for other um, advertising outlets as well. And uh, a couple of the agencies have relationships um, with different advertising firms that are not Miller and Greystone. Uh, since EO 47, uh, since EO 47, has the city worked with the with contracted out firms to ensure the requiring the half of agencies ad budgets go to community media is met? And yes, are part of that already. And also, since EO 47, has the administration seen city agency marketing managers take a more active role in community 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 media ad placements? now that the city maintains that and, and community media directory. Yes, um, we have seen uh, active participation with um, Miller and Greystone in their um, administering of um, advertising placements and they have been coached and the um, community ethnic media directory and are an active partner in helping us reach that 50% advertising spending goal. And also we have seen uh, an incredible uptake with um, individual agency press, marketing, and fiscal contacts. We engage a, a wide variety of contacts at each of the agencies, um, and uh, they have been uh, very energized and excited about uh, the opportunity to advertise to different populations. Thank you. Does the administration have a prediction of the expected spending on FY22 on admin and community media outlets? Um, we're just now finishing the second full fiscal year um, and uh, beginning to package and analyze our data for how we performed in fiscal 2021. We do not yet have a, an understanding of um, our advertising budget citywide for fiscal year 2022, um, but are hoping to adapt to the, the changing landscape right now. Do you think outside of COVID-19, is it going to be something compatible to what we saw last year? Again, outside of that budget for COVID-19, something compatible? Uh, it's a good question, council member. I, I think that a significant portion of the city's advertising budget for the last year was focused on COVID-19 um, response, health and safety measures and recovery. Um, I think we will continue to see a lot of targeted advertisements for COVID-19 uh, recovery and vaccinations reaching um, community and ethnic media outlets and the broader landscape. Um, beyond that response, um, it is up to each individual agency and their own um, budgeting process to uh, advertise. And can you provide us a breakdown of the proportion of ad buys by language and or community demographic uh, for fiscal 2020, roughly what percentage of the city spending on television or radio advertisement goes towards outlets with five or fewer staff 
And are there any obstacle that will prevent the city from significantly increasing this percentage? Thanks, council member. I, I don't have information on some of the demographic breakdowns of the different outlets we're reaching or on the um, television and radio that meet the five or fewer employees definition. Um, what I can provide are um, some information on the language breakdown of ads placed. Um, we place advertisements in eligible community and ethnic media outlets in um, a variety of languages, a couple dozen different languages, um, including English. Um, the top five languages other than English that we are placing advertisements in are Spanish, Chinese, uh, including Mandarin and Cantonese, Korean, and Haitian Creole. Do you, do you have a percentage uh, breakdown? Like for example, 20% Spanish, 30% Mandarin. Yep, uh, we spend 12% um, uh, of our advertising spend in Spanish, um, just about 8% of our advertising spend in Chinese, um, and around 3% of our advertising spend in Korean and Haitian Creole. Great, and I'll just, uh, to get to mention one question, are there any approved outlet certified NWBEs? And so roughly what's the proportion? Uh, we don't have the information at our fingertips of which of the outlets are MWBEs, um, but it, we can get back to you with more information on that. It's something we're, we're interested in researching as well. That. Can you take a calculated guess? I mean, is it few, is it usually, something around 50%, what do you? What do you uh, I hesitate to take a calculated guess, but I would say given um, just the wide variety of the directory that we have and the community outlets that we are reaching, I imagine it's fairly high. Okay, great, great, fantastic. Uh, let me turn it back to the moderator. I believe that we have a second round of questions. Yes, I'm seeing council member Rodriguez. Um, you can speak when ready. Time starts now. No, well, I want to thank uh, Hamid, uh, Brother Hamid, for being here, and I want to keep it positive because I know that we are moving in the right direction. On, on, you know, uh, not only identifying challenges that we have uh, so far, but also giving credit to Major De Blasio. Nobody else has done what he what he did. It. So Hen and his team, and Jose Bayon, everyone, they've been trying to look at, you know, how we can do better. However, we cannot be shy when it comes to, you know, not seeing the reality. And that's what I hope that we will address as we will create that permanent office. It, do you have the numbers on, and, and of course, when you look at the percentage, this is about, you know, not, not only on the, this administration, the administration has made progress, but when you look about 29% of New York City population are Latinos. You know, and 27% are black and 15% are Asian. So at some point, whatever we do from leadership at City Hall, from investment in, in on women in minority contract to investing in media, we should use those percentages and make people accountable to commit. And that's what I say. I, I hope that Miller and the other uh, publisher, they will be testifying today because they're the one making all that money. So I hope that, you know, first of all, I'm sure that they knew that this year was taking place. And I'm sure that they should testify about how they've been visited in this community, how they, how, how it came out that there's no a Latino in charge of the millers and others who are also responsible to lead, you know, the effort uh, to, to put those ads, to invest those dollars. But again, for me speaking, coming from my heart on the frustration knowing at the same time, recognizing at the same time that here you were here from, you know, El Diario, Impacto Latino, you know, eh, the Queens and, and Javier's and many others. They were here from, you know, my brother who they were speaking in Spanish because that's the language they speak. And they don't know how to navigate all those procurements process. And that's why it's so important to advance with this. But do you know, can you give us the dollars? How much money did the city invest last year? On, on advertising? Um, on total advertising? Yes. Um, well, so for um, 
print and digital uh, outlets. Everything, everything on advertising. Yeah. Everything. I probably have it on uh, one of my spreadsheets here. Um, I think our total advertising spending in fiscal 20 was just over $29 million. You know how much the Miller and the other two publishers control? I don't have that uh, at hand. But I, I'm sure it's more than 12 million. You know what I mean? I, I, I know that they have the biggest, the biggest pie. And, 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 and that's why I hope I would like to hear from them. And again, I'm looking at them as potential partner too. I give people a chance for people to look at it and share that information. So, you know, lo que estoy diciéndole, estamos hablando de 28 millones de dólares que se invirtieron el año pasado en advertising. Estamos hablando que en la comunidad latina invirtieron aproximadamente un 12%, se hicieron advertising. Cuando nosotros somos el 29%, cuando la ciudad es 27% afroamericana y el 15% asiática. Entonces, hoy de nuevo, le estoy dando las gracias también al chief staff porque está testificando y porque ha dicho que hay una disposición de que la alcaldía está lista para trabajar con nosotros para pasar este proyecto de ley. Pero las voces, los rostros de los latinos, de los asiáticos, de los judíos, de los que, que están aquí para testificar son muy importantes. Estos días son cruciales para que ustedes tengan, sean todo parte de esta iniciativa hacer el caso de por qué tenemos que pasar este proyecto de ley. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you so much. Moderator, do we have any other council members who would like uh, to speak or ask a question? Um, I'm seeing a hand from council member Dharma Diaz. Time starts now. I will definitely be brief. I just want to thank my colleagues, Carrera and Rodriguez for the effort that you're putting forth here today. Definitely coming from uh, a high number of of constituents that happen that are Latino and knowing the struggles that they have with communication and the media, I'm empowered by, by your passion and your voices. And I also want to um, further compliment um, Councilman Rodriguez for, for and, and, um, speaking to the point that the administration is finally acknowledging our place in society. So while we thank the administration for acknowledging us, it doesn't mean that the fight doesn't continue. Para los colegas que están, que están ahí presentes, que van a testificar hoy, como ha dicho el concejal Rodríguez, no, no temen en hablar con pasión en inglés, en español, en patua, como sea que tengan que hablar para poder demostrar su agonía y, y su proceso. Thank you. I'm handing it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Diaz. Appreciate your word, as always. Uh, moderator, anybody else? I'm not seeing any hands right now. Um, so if there are no further questions, I think we can move on to the public. Thank you so much. Again, I wanna thank the administration. Thank you for making an institution. I seldom want you can make an institutional change uh, through an executive order. And now it's gonna be codified into law as we're looking forward to passing uh, this uh, bill and moving it forward. I wanna thank the administration. I wanna thank you, the chief of staff, for all the work that has been put forth uh, in making sure that we have a more equitable uh, approach uh, to dealing with all these advertising dollars. We're not there yet. We're not where we used to be, but we're not where we need to be there yet but we're moving in the right direction. And, and one of the hardest things to get done is to get started. Uh, and so I appreciate all the effort. I appreciate all of the, uh, the administration seeing the value actually, because at the end of the day is the value that we see in making this uh, a reality. And so with that, uh, we're ready, I believe, uh, to move to the public. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling uh, individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you after the panelists has completed their testimony. 
For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and give you a go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome Kamlesh Mehta, followed by Gail Smith, and then followed by Javier Castaño. Time starts now. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for taking an important issue of the ethnic media. Uh, truly speaking, without the support of New York City, the ethnic media will not survive, even though there is a population, population of more than 3 million people. And uh, uh, not only uh, Spanish or Bengali or English or any, I mean, Spanish or other languages, it is very important that the ethnic media keep getting support from the city. So the community which doesn't speak English, they can also get the message, they can learn the, about the project, about the developments, what is happening in the New York City, about the laws, so many things. We must make sure that there is an ethnic media office in New York City itself. And it is also managed by the ethnic media itself because they know what we need, how we have to get into the, our, our communities. So if the city opens a, a specific office or outlet for the ethnic media, that will be a great help. During the COVID, most of the uh, ethnic media would have closed if it was not supported by the city. So for the benefit of uh, New York City and the citizens of New York City, the ethnic community, which is more than 3 million people, we must have a office in New York City for the ethnic media. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Uh, Gail Smith, you may begin. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and members of the Committee on Government Operations. Thank you for the opportunity to testify for this very important legislation. I am Gail Smith Carrillo. Um, I am the publisher of Impacto Latino. My father, Carlos Carrillo, an immigrant from Argentina, started publishing Impacto in 1967 to give voice to the growing Latino immigrant community, particularly the growing Dominican community, but regardless of geographic heritage and touching all five boroughs. Today, our mission continues to be the same. I'm here to express to you the critical importance of ethnic media to a city like New York City that has the largest number of ethnicities in the country. New York City has an extraordinarily diverse population. Just Latinos represent uh, nearly 30% of the population according to census data. Latinos culturally keep their language. There are significant proportions of non-English speaking households in New York City, as in many parts of the country. There is also a large percentage of the Latino population that is technology deficient, either because of affordability or lack of technical knowledge. For many in our community, newspapers are a lifeline. Ethnic media connects migrants that are culturally and linguistically diverse with their own local communities. It reaches 55% of the city's population. On a more practical level, ethnic media are essential sources of information. We provide information on city services, health, migrants' rights, and other types of information to live and thrive in New York City. We inform and educate the community on voting systems, aged care services, and others, and provide information that is attuned to the particular needs of our audience. And let me make a most important point. The information we provide is verifiable information, not information like some information found on social media. This is a service that mainstream media are largely unable to provide with their focus on a broad audience. But without it, our community potentially miss out on important information. We are valuable ally allies to city government. We communicate available services provided. And most importantly, we explain how they work. This is particularly crucial in the Latino community, given the high fear that exists and reluctance to tap into the services. We capture the subtleties and nuances that one size fits all government communication 
education campaigns cannot provide. We are in a unique position to effectively communicate government initiatives Time in length. So it's perfectly understood. Can I continue? I have about oh, one more minute. Have 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, the COVID pandemic highlighted the crucial importance of ethnic media. We provided the specific educational information for our communities. We worked hand in hand with city agencies to uh, educate our communities. But as this common knowledge, news platforms are facing an existential crisis. We need New York City support to continue with our mission to service our communities and continue to work hand in hand with New York agencies. I want to uh, thank Council Member Idanis Rodriguez. Thank you for your passionate support. Speaker Johnson, Brooklyn President Eric Adams, and Council Member Feliz for introducing legislature for this council. Uh, to this council. And I want to thank also uh, Jose Bayona and the de Blasio administration for all they have done to support ethnic media, in particular for the executive order, which is the foundation for this legislation. I respectfully urge this committee to approve this legislation. Without it, all of New the New York City diverse communities will suffer. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about going over. It's okay. We understand. Thank you. I'd like to now call on Javier Castaño. After Javier, we will hear from George Fiala, followed by Eddie Heredia. Time starts now. Hi. Uh, since I arrived in New York City 37 years ago, I have always worked as a reporter and photographer of news events. I have been editor-in-chief of El Diario La Prensa and OI Nueva York, and I have a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University. I have written extensively about immigration, housing, employment, education, culture, and crime. I know New York very well, and I recognize the importance of the ethnic media in the city as diverse as this, but I don't want to talk about these facts, but you know these facts. I am here to testify because the ethnic media is being used and abused for too long. At this time, I. The, uh, the first time that I testified in, in the city council was on January 28, 2015. Councilman Carlos Menchaca called representatives of the ethnic media to testify about the El Diario La Prensa going down the drain. At that time, we heard many promises, but nothing happened to benefit the ethnic media and the Latino press. On December 11, 2014 and February 16, 2016, Melissa Mar Viverito, then president of the city council, brought members of the ethnic media to city hall and promised to help us with money and resources. But again, nothing happened. Everything started changing on May 22nd, 2019, when Mayor Bill de Blasio signed the executive order 47 to benefit the ethnic media. Each New York City agency has to give at least 50% of the advertising budget to print and online ethnic media. During these times of big corporation, anti-immigrant law, and the pandemic, this money is keeping the ethnic media alive and thriving. The input of Jose Bayona as director of community and ethnic media at, at the New York City office has been the key of this initiative. And now, Corey Johnson, president of the city council, Eric Adams, Borough, uh, Brooklyn Borough President, Councilman Idani Rodriguez and Oswald Felix want to take this initiative to a higher level. An executive order can be killed by the new mayor. This is why they want to create the New York City Agency to connect and give advertising dollars to the ethnic media. I welcome this initiative because it is the first in the United States. It will be an example for other cities to emulate. I support this initiative because I will help. It will help the bottom line of the ethnic media. And I support this initiative because democracy and freedom of information with benefits. The government has given media cor big corporations time expired for too long, and they seldom reach out to our community. I'm about to finish. 
This New York City agency for the ethnic media will help balance the inequalities of this city. It will help solidify democracy in an era that we are talking about news deserts, digital divide, the lack of civil engagement and low voting participation. As director of Queens Latino, these issues that we are paying attention in our platform. This is an initiative of New York City and no political party or educational institution and as CUNY should take credit for it. It is not for publication based outside of the city. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will now call on George Fiala. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you. Yes, I want to repeat what was just said about, um, we also testified at Carlos Menchaca's hearing five years ago, and it was only until the last year or two that we finally see some support from city government. Now, why should a, a local newspaper, I publish, uh, you might know, the Red Hook Star Review, in, uh, it's a community paper in a, in a part of New York, part of Brooklyn that has both a upscale part of it and a public housing part of it. And we write for both um, communities and it's actually very, makes for a very dynamic newspaper. Uh, what I wanted to say was that uh, also, I wanna say that Jose has been very good to us. In other words, we went to visit him. I took my advertising manager and he was very solicitous and he explained us uh, the program and we get our ads from Miller Advertising. And uh, we used to get about one a year, whenever there was a hurricane season starting, we got one ad from you know, whatever agency tells you to uh, worry about hurricanes. That was just one. This last issue was unbelievable. We had about eight ads, half for ranked choice voting and half for uh, to tell people, elderly, young people to get their vaccinations. It's, it's tremendous. We don't charge that much for the ads, but uh, people, when they've been seeing this paper for 10 years or 11 years, and what we're selling in the advertising portion of it is the credibility that we get because we're a community voice. And I believe that uh, people take the ads in the local paper more seriously. So when they look, when they see an ad for uh, ranked choice voting, they'll read it just like they'll read the story. Here we have an article about the, uh, you know, the local council race. I guess what I'm trying to say is that this is a wonderful program. I've always thought that, uh, you know, local newspapers can be a conduit for uh, not only news from the city, but also paid commercial messages. I'm not saying that we deserve it or not deserve it, but it helps me pay writers. I have uh, a nice staff that enjoys writing and uh, we're part of the city's commerce. Let me think if I have anything else to say. We write about the Board of Standards and Appeals. <laughs> we write about the mayoral race. We write about uh, the Gowanus rezoning, all topics that we help educate the public in order to understand better the world around them. And uh, so anyway, I'm very thankful for the city's use of our pages and uh, hope it, I hope it uh, continues. And I know there's a new mayor next year. Time expired. Good luck to whoever wins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will now hear from Eddie Heredia. We have an interpreter for Mr. Heredia. Um, so I'm going to call the interpreter to introduce himself. Eh, sí, voy a, voy a hacer, voy a hacerlo en español. Ahí está llamando al intérprete. Time starts now. Hablar. Puede empezar ahora. Ok, vamos, ok. Eh, primeramente agradecer la, la iniciativa de lo que de lo que está haciendo porque eso es una forma de que estamos llegando cada vez más a que podamos resolver algunas de las cosas de la, de la que nosotros necesitamos acá eh, quiero saber si, si van a ir eh, traduciendo o... yes uh, 
Sí, ellos van a traducir. You could translate. Okay. Eh, en they, el caso... Un, un momentito, por favor. Esto no... If you could hold the clock for a second. Uh, can you hear uh, interpreter? He's... What he's sharing? Can you... You're fine. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Now we can hear you. We okay. Hear you. So first, first, I want to thank everyone for the initiative that's being brought forward because this gives us a way to resolve a lot of the issues that affect us. Adelante, señor. Okay. Eh, en mi caso, por ejemplo, yo, eh, igual que muchos, tenemos programa de televisión que llegamos a una comunidad eh, principalmente dominicana Permíteme. In my case, like many others, we have a TV shows that communicate to the communities, much like mine, the Dominican community. Adelante, señor. Eh, durante ya más de 20 años estamos haciendo estos programas que le están llegando principalmente a una comunidad que muchos de ellos no hablan el inglés, hablan, son, hablan español, que es su principal lengua. Permítame. During these 20 years, we've been making this kind of content TV shows that reaches our communities to people that specifically don't speak English. Adelante. Y, la, y lo que hemos estado inclusive en el en momento cuando, se, cuando lo, la Torre Gemela eh, cayeron, también estuvimos ahora con la pandemia haciendo programas en vivo informando a la comunidad lo que está pasando en el momento. And also, in fact, we've been creating content since the time of the Twin Towers and as well as during the pandemic, doing live shows, communicating to our community what was happening. Adelante. También tenemos que resaltar que eh, tenemos un equipo profesional que muchos de ellos que han salido de la universidad, tanto son periodistas, muchos eh, son locutores y también eh, tenemos equipos que son bastante caros que, y sin embargo no tenemos, eh, no nos llegan los recursos para seguir invirtiendo en hacer un trabajo de más calidad. When we and in the present time we have a team a team of professionals that all came from the university journalists uh, also like spokespeople and this has been very costly very expensive however we haven't been given any of the resources that the city has given out to other media groups adelante tenemos que sí eh, darle el crédito tanto al presidente del condado del Bronx eh, Eric Adam como también al Corey Johnson y a y Dani Rodríguez y otros que se han preocupado por lograr acercarnos a, a, a dónde están los recursos. And we would like to give credit to like the borough president, uh, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Councilman Rodriguez, and many others that have been concerned with this whole fact and have helped us to find some help to achieve these resources to find out where they are. Adelante. Sin embargo, eh, lo que estamos eh, solicitando ahora es que se nos tome en cuenta para las distintas campañas que se, que se están haciendo para que eso ayude a que los trabajos que estamos haciendo puedan llegar a esa comunidad que, está, que, que nos está viendo día por día. And what we're asking for in this moment is to be taken account or taken or to think about us when you're developing these new campaigns in in the search to be able to reach all these other communities. Adelante. Que también es es cierto que la tanto la información eh, que llegue eh, de la tanto la publicidad que sea en español que le llegue a esa gente, pero que también una facilidad de, de cómo eh, llenar la, la documentación y todos los lo, lo mecanismos que hay que hacer para poder eh, in, eh, que esas esa, esa cuentas puedan llegar a nosotros. Counts, Richard. And also to, to get the required information needed for whatever publicity is being do, done or any ads in Spanish, as well as an ease in how to fill out the documentation or whatever mechanisms are required so as to be able to obtain these resources. Adelante. Y nada, agradecerle a todos los que están trabajando en esto para que esto sea una, una realidad y que podamos ya en un futuro no tener que tener este, este, estas conversaciones, sino que, que podamos sentirnos felices de que esto está, esta reunión de hoy esté dando resultados mañana. 
And other than that, just to thank everyone for all the work, all the hard work they have been doing to try to make this a reality so that that way this no longer has to be a conversation. It would be something that has already happened in the past and that happily the resources will become available and we could just continue with the work altogether. Thank you. Al concejal y Danis, el, eh, el, tanto a Ariadna, tanto a Corey Johnson, tanto al, eh, también al conce, concejal perdón, ayer, um, Cabrera. Al concejal Cabrera también, que también está poniendo su granito de arena para que esto sea posible. And also to give thanks to the council people, Idanis, Johnson, Cabrera, for everything they have done from starting from the speck of sand so that everything could eventually be done. Time expired. Se okay. deben el tiempo. Okay. Okay. Gracias. Thank you. We uh, will now hear from Anthony Varia, followed by Caroline Pimentel, followed by Abu Tahir. Anthony Ibarria, you may begin when the sergeant, sergeant calls in. Time starts yeah, now. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, I basically echo everything that all of you are saying. And I myself understand that when the executive order 47 was made, it helped all of us. What I did is I, re I reinvested that money in our newspaper and we created a page, an information page that was called Nueva York's Mi Ciudad. And we initiated content for people, uh, our readers, to be able to read um, uh, all the community events within the city and the happenings in the city. As the general manager of the largest ethnic medium, El Especialito, I am so excited and so enthusiastic about this initiative. Why? Hopefully it passes. Why? Because our community needs to feel empowered. Our community needs to feel important. Our community needs to feel like they are part of the city. Our community needs to, uh, to know that City Hall is counting on them and they have a voice. With this, this initiative will do just that. And it's something that was lacking in other administrations. So I thank the Blasio and I thank the city council to continue, continue doing this. Speaking to the ethnic community and the language that they understand and the language that they feel comfortable with is just what they need and it's just what they want. The, the Hispanic communities that I represent is vital to the growth of the city of New York and making them feel part of the same is just a win-win for everybody. I personally feel, truly feel that this initiative is a huge step forward for the city and for the Hispanic community at large and all the publishers and all the media who caters to all the other ethnic media. So I'd like to thank all of you for the opportunity for me to expressing my opinions and my thought. Thank you. Thank you. We will now call on Carlene Pimentel. You may begin when the sergeant calls time. Starts now. Hi, how are you everyone? Uh, my name is Caroline Pimentel. I'm representing El Corazón La Medicina, Ocean Production. And for me, it's uh, very important that the city support our uh, channels because like my mother, she doesn't speak English. She likes to watch those kind of uh, channels so they understand. And whatever ads that you send from the city is especially go for our community, the Spanish community or the other countries that are here. But well, I'm, I'm representing right now, especially the Spanish one, the one that doesn't speak English. Uh, so it's very important that we share for everybody in every country too that are here in the United States. Thank you. 
Thank you. We will now hear from Abu Tahir. Okay, time starts. I'm sorry. Yeah, Hello. Time starts now. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for giving us opportunity. Um, I thank uh, Mr. Kobara, the chair, and your wonderful, as you mentioned, a wonderful moderator and speaker, Corey Johnson. I came, my name is Abu Tahir. I'm the editor of the weekly Bangla Patrika, this, this newspaper, which established in 1996. And uh, since then, it is publishing every week. It's almost 26 years now. And also we started a television called Time Television in 2014, 24 hour full TV station to serving the community, the Bangladeshi community in the US. Bangladeshi community is one of the most fast growing, fast growing community in New York City, as you know. So when I came in this country in 1992, I found, I was a journalist. And I work with the newspaper. I'm just giving a little bit of background to understand the uh, council members, what's the importance of the community uh, media, and also how the uh, how the community media was with uh, city council and how the days is going right now. So in 19, I, I remember in 19 uh, when we came, uh, we were in the in the newspaper, but there was no connection at all with city council with that thing, with that, nothing, zero. In 19, and I think end of 1990, after 1996, there is an organization form called IPA, Independent Press Association. I was one of the member of the press association and we raised our first voice that, okay, we have to be part of a uh, city and it is not that the one media was gonna get the opportunity, they will attend the press, even they, we don't get the press invitation for the press conference at that time, absolutely detached from, City Council. I'm talking about uh, end of 1990. Then um, independent press station cannot sustain the, um, there is another organization from called New York City Community Media Alliance. They work with the, the all the ethnic media, raise the boys, we start the bargain with New York City Council, and then uh, it start to move. And then um, near, uh, New York City Community Media Council, Media Alliance, they, um, they can't sustain them then, they hand over to all these things to, as Mr. Hamad mentioned, um, to um, CUNY, J School, with their ethnic media department. They build up an ethnic media department. Anyway, so what I, I was one of the, uh, um, you know, person who, as uh, other, my colleague mentioned, that, uh, you know, um, in New York City Council hearing five years ago, uh, we are working day and night. The, the ethnic media is very important for New York City. Uh, New York City, you know, all the, all, since the United States have the immigration system, the people are coming and almost all the generation who are here, came here. Time expired. Can I stay another few minutes, another one minute? Yes. Okay, so the, the uh, what I said, the ethnic media is very important. About, about more than 60 million Americans, they are depend, absolutely depend on the community, especially the New York City, uh, who are the hub of the immigrant community. And uh, as I mentioned, what is the importance of the ethnic media? Say about time television, which we, uh, 24 hour TV, last, well, last year, uh, March 17, when the pandemic came, from that day to now, every day, every day, one hour show, 9 to 10 p.m. And serving the well, Bangladeshi community, one of the worst victim of COVID-19, about more than 300 people has been lost their lives by this, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19. And there was no one, they, and they was confused. They were, they are scared what they're supposed to do. So the ethnic media, Time Television, Bangla Patrika, they provide all the information. They stand behind the community. Because they don't understand New York Times. They don't understand the other, uh, the uh, the mainstream media they are depend on their ethnic community media in their language so I think it's very important and I'm urging the city council member who are here to uh, you know ex I mean the executive order or build up a new uh, you know um, department where they can take care and understand the importance of ethnic media it is very important it is life uh, you know line of the community living in New York City. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kubra. This is, thank you so much, the others, uh, council members. Thank you so much uh, for sharing. 
Uh, before we move forward, I want to pass on, uh, as, as you know, I'm, I'm the chair of this committee, and uh, but I'm going to pass the baton to uh, Council Member uh, Rodriguez, and he will be sharing the rest of today's hearing. Thank you, Chair. And the only thing that I would say to the participant, we're going to be also a stay with a time. Uh, that is given by the moderator because we also have another meetings coming out after this hearing. Thank you, Chair. We will now hear testimony from Manuel Ruiz, followed by Kaushik Ahmed, followed by Kevin Boyle. Uh, Manuel, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Um, it looks like we do not have a microphone associated with Mr. Ruiz. Um, we will come back to you. Um, I will move to uh, Kaushik Ahmed, followed by Kevin Boyle. Time starts now. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Councilman Cabrera, Councilman Rodriguez, and others uh, for speaking in favor of uh, the ethnic media. Uh, my name is uh, Koshik Ahmed, I publish weekly Bengali newspaper since 1991, and we are running now 31 years. And this newspaper is also for Bangladesh community. Uh, as you know, the Bangladesh community, uh, uh, I, I should say that's, uh, that was the time when we started publishing newspaper. This is about the time the Bangladesh community in New York City began growing. A good number of uh, people were trying to start their business here. A good number of people began driving taxis and new immigrants started coming. At the time, they needed the guidance. They needed the city health information. As the new immigrants and other immigrants do not read English language newspapers, they depended and still depending on us, that means the ethnic newspaper. We try to provide as much information as possible. Uh, till 2014, from uh, 1991 till 2014, uh, we used to sell our newspapers. But uh, since uh, 2014, we are just distributing this newspaper free. And our only source of revenue is advertising money. As you know, the 44% of the city's population is immigrants. They speak their own languages at home. We are uh, serving these people through our newspapers. I strongly claim that now Bangladesh community, the community, the city says this is the fastest, uh, one of the fastest growing communities in the city. Now it's very strong and it is because of our ethnic our newspapers in Bengali language. And the first time in 2019, Bill de Blasio, Mayor Bill de Blasio signed this executive order in favor of our newspapers. I thank him. I thank everybody who are working for this executive order. That is the only lifeline for the ethnic newspapers in this city. Otherwise, it is very hard to survive as a newspaper in this community. Thank you again to everybody. Thank you. We will now hear from Kevin Boyle. Time starts now. Looks like we are not getting a response from Mr. Boyle. Um, Hello, how about that? There we go. Now we can hear you. Go. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Kevin Boyle from the Rockaway Times. I would like to point out that we are a free newspaper 
wholly reliant on advertising. And by free, that means we're more free than the internet. You know, the internet's free, except people need access to the internet. And they don't necessarily have it, particularly in Rockaway, where we have such a high concentration of nursing homes and public housing. So executive order 47 is crucial to our existence. And um, I really support everybody's efforts getting behind this. I'm gonna uh, cut it short because it's a long day for everybody, but thank you for everybody behind this effort. Thanks. We will now hear from Luciano Vasquez. After Luciano, we will hear from Juan Miguel Jimenez and followed by no Nolasco. Uh, we will need an interpreter for Luciano Vasquez, uh, if the interpreter can um, give instruction. Buenos dias. Time Buenos dias. Now. Entonces, si me puedes dar una oración a la vez, después tradujo, traduzco y después me da la próxima oración para ir todo más fluido. Adelante, señor. Primero agradecer la oportunidad de la participación que nosotros tenemos. First, I want to thank for the opportunity for us to participate. Adelante. El estado de Nueva York tiene aproximadamente más de un millón de y pico de dominicanos. The state of New York has approximately one million and something Dominicans. Y en los momentos difíciles que ha tenido los Estados Unidos y sobre todo el estado de Nueva York, los medios de comunicación de nosotros dominicanos han estado siempre presentes. And during the hard times that the United States and also the state of New York has had, us, the Dominican media has always been there to inform. Adelante. Por consiguiente, vemos como una oportunidad de que ustedes o que este proyecto sea aprobado en beneficio de este segmento que nosotros somos su voz dentro del estado de Nueva York. And in, in seeing that the opportunity of this project to be approved will give us the possibility to be also a voice here in the state of New York. Adelante. Pero, pero a pesar de que no han, no han tomado en cuenta por más de 20 años en el aspecto de la publicidad, siempre hemos estado presentes en la política de, les, de aquí, del estado de Nueva York, llevando el mensaje a la comunidad dominicana. And despite we haven't been taken into account for more than 20 years now, we still have been here present for any policies that have been affected here in the city of New York. Adelante. Porque la comunicación es un sacerdocio, es un compromiso que tenemos para informar nuestra comunidad. Because the communication is a commitment that we have to inform our community. Adelante. Y estas vibras que ha de tomar para que nos tomen en cuenta cómo nosotros producir la noticia tanto del actual alcalde, los concejales y Danis Rodríguez, Cabrera, y los demás concejales hemos estado ahí llevando las informaciones de su propuesta en beneficio de la comunidad dominicana. And just like the other councilmen have worked so hard, we've always been here present while they've taken us into account to bring their messages across, whether it's the mayor, the councilman, Rodriguez, Cabrera, we have been here helping with the proposal to bring their messages like they have. Adelante. En esta pandemia, lloramos junto a los dominicanos, pero no dejamos de informarlos, porque era el papel de nosotros, a pesar de no tomarlo en cuenta en este proceso. And during the pandemic, we have cried together, but we have also never stopped bringing in information, understanding that that was our duty to bring information. Adelante. Por consiguiente, nuestra comunidad, que en su mayoría no maneja el idioma, el inglés, eh, sin embargo, las mayorías de los medios de comunicación radial, escrito, televisivo, digital, nuestras plataformas digitales de los diferentes programas siempre están al servicio de este sector importante que vive aquí en el estado de Nueva York. And in consequence of our communication, knowing that all our followers and listeners do not speak English. Despite of this, we have brought them information through all our media, whether written, TV, digital, radio, digital platforms, always serving this very important part population of New York State. 
Adelante. Por consiguiente, permítanos, si somos parte del problema y parte de la solución, permítanos seguir viviendo como medio de comunicación, porque necesitamos que nos tomen en cuenta y necesitamos esa publicidad, no solo para beneficiarnos, sino también para que la colectividad de los dominicanos y dominicanas se beneficien en la información. And if we are a part of the problem and part of the solution, let us come with you. Let us live. Let us be part of this media and take us into account in any publicity or any campaign in the future so we can continue bridging that communication for the people of New York. Cuando nos montamos en un bus, en un tren, sabemos cómo piensan ellos. Sabemos su dolor. Lo escuchamos. Lo pensamos. Pero también es necesario que estos medios puedan sobrevivir en medio de la crisis en la que estamos viviendo. And when we get on a bus and when we are get on a train, we know how they feel, how they think. They, we understand the pain they're going through. So allow us to continue living and continue giving this service to the people in the communities of New York. Let us continue as a media service. Adelante. Un país como los Estados Unidos y Nueva York, lleno de historia, lleno de comunidades integradas que forman y surge desde 1776 a 1862, esta gran nación forjada por todas las etnias, es necesario que también nosotros seamos parte de esa historia y de esta formación para vivir en los medios de comunicación y poder informar. And as a U.S., as a country, as a New York state, full of all its history and integrated communications from 1776 to 1872. Time expired. We forged all by the, different, by the differences of, that everyone brings to the table. Let us be part of this history, of the history that has to come by bringing this service of media and communications to our communities. Gracias, que Dios bendiga a los Estados Unidos y que Dios ilumine a cada uno de ustedes para poder hacer la realidad de nosotros ser parte también de como Estado y como comunicación. And may God bless America and the United States and allow some illumination for all of you to help us be part of the U.S., be part of all this that is happening and part of the history of New York and the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we Gracias. will hear from Juan Miguel Jimenez, followed by Nolasco, followed by Roberto Amaro Garcia, followed by Gregorio Morobel. Juan Miguel Jimenez. Our time starts now. Did you mute Sam? Yes. Hello? Hi, we can hear you. OK. Um, Hold on one second, please. Just say, so. Hello? We can hear you. Can... you. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you for this space and especially for the younger population in the media, Latinx media today represented by me and many others that we might be able to maybe listen today. Um, Latino immigrants have an important role to play in the United States economy. However, we tend to be less educated and are less than maybe the native born population. Our children will more likely to than their parents to earn a higher education and achieve economic success. That's a fact I'm doing myself in as my, my example. And the big three that we have to pay attention here, especially in this area, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Mexicans, comprehensive at the sixth is 70% of all the New York Latinos, the other nationalities, Ecuadorians, Colombians, and Central Americans. They figure uh, notably in a mosaic of Spanish speaking groups. No other city in the country displays as such a, a, a like more people display us here in Hispanic origins and people here in, in New York. Hispanic culture is having a profound effect on American food, music, sports, beauty products, fashion, politics, and much more. 
this influence is not due to only the sheer to size of the Hispanic population, which is right now 50, around broadly 52 million now in the United States. Roughly one, six, one, of six, one, of, one in six Americans with a projection to nearly one in three by 20, 2050. Initially, throughout office and other immigrant press by those who are suited in Europe, European ethic press in the United States, speak, Spanish language newspapers are conceived a transitory medium that allowed new immigrants to adapt to a new nationality and new country. That's why having these voices, especially younger voices and people on TV that reflect who they are and they can reflect themselves is such a big importance so we can support it and we can promote it so we can be able to make the transition smoother and also be more peaceful and also to get relate to what we have here to this vast clash of influences. Around 85% of Hispanic listen still Spanish language music in the United States. FM radio remains the most popular music source, but platforms such as Pandora, YouTube Music, Spotify, and also used on a regular basis by Hispanic consumers. And the same thing happened with many other medias, medias that we actually provide, podcasts, TV, newspapers, and we all have it all and we all produce it all because we need to have that kind of sources so we can promote, speak, and have a language, and also a voice that represent what I'm happened and what's going on here. There's not much to say, just thank you. Thank you for the space that we can be able to express ourselves and also to be able to make this happen and make a difference. Since now on, maybe this is an opportunity for us to keep growing and to making this more broad and also more inclusive for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will now turn to Nulasco. Uh, Nulasco will need an interpreter if the interpreter can give instruction. Uh, hi. Time uh, starts now. Thanks. Sí, si me puedes permitir, me das una oración. Después tra puedo traducir. Después vas con la próxima oración. Oh, Adelante. Okay. Uh, yo voy a hablar en inglés. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks to the elected officials for uh, bringing me to. Uh, uh, be in this critical issue like uh, Latino media. Uh, I'm Nolasco from New York Media Group, a small corporation that began with the digital media and news or digital newspaper, New York that is like uh, New Yorkers in Spanish. For about 10 years, we have been covering more than 3,000 of events and posting things of thousands of news about New York City. Uh, the, grow, the growing of this project empire, empired me to create Latino Social Media Week, a big Latino event uh, for our Latino people in social media. Uh, this event, I, I do this event together with Google. Uh, I'm here to testify that I'm part of a group of media that have not received any advertising to post in our media from ethnic community media NYC office. This initiative will be great for our community, the Latino community, and for our brother and sisters, journalists, reporters, photographers, and others. Thanks to the Board of President Eric Adams, the Speaker of the City, Corey Johnson, and Council Member Danis Rodriguez, who worked in this project that I hope becomes a law. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear testimony from Roberto Amoro Garcia. You may begin when the Sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Uh, when I started, uh, good afternoon. Uh, the, the, in this initiative is very important. Um, but uh, I want to first thank Eric Adams, uh, Board of President of uh, Brooklyn, uh, Councilman uh, Cabrera, and Idanis Rodriguez, and Corey Johnson for the, the support that they're giving. That I think that the most important, most, most of the uh, media that works in the ethnic communities is uh, the main support are like uh, the restaurants, uh, the small business that are part of the community that most of the time are the main supporter of uh, our activities. Uh, everybody knows that uh, 
newspapers, TV shows, TV programs, news. Uh, the main, the only main, uh, the only way of support is uh, advertisement. And uh, during the pandemic, most of those places, uh, restaurants, uh, clubs, uh, they closed or they were working on minimum capacity. So that happened, that made possible that a lot of people reduce the production team, some of them disappear because at that point, everybody that you will be asking for advertising of to support, they say, well, I would like to help you, but nothing happened. I can do it because you know I'm not producing anything and I'm not getting money from the city or whatever reason. But uh, with this initiative, I think that will be uh, a, a good thing for uh, get more people into make better production, more quality in our media. And also that if anything happen again, like this uh, pandemic that closed the city for uh, many, many months, uh, we will be still able to inform the community and be part of the uh, effort in order to uh, communicate uh, the things that the city need to communicate. So in that order, I think that the support that the city council uh, and authority do to this uh, proposal will be really important in order for uh, the small media uh, production company continue to work and also for uh, improve our quality because uh, we have another way to get uh, uh, the money that we need to continue to uh, doing uh, our job. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Gregorio Morabal. We can begin when the subject is Time starts now. Saludos, saludos. Eh, voy a, a empezarme en español, por lo que voy a necesitar el intérprete. Yes, está bien, entonces quiero que va, hable con voz alta porque su conexión está ba bastante bajita. Entonces okay. háblame fuerte, deme una oración, después puedo traducir y después sigues con la próxima oración. Adelante. Perfecto. Sí, primeramente quiero eh, saludar esta iniciativa por cuanto viene a contribuir con lo que es la descentralización de la comunicación en el estado de Nueva York. Well, first I want to give thanks for this initiative because of its contribution on decentralizing communications here in New York City. Adelante. Saludar a Idani Rodríguez, el concejal Idani Rodríguez, por ser parte de este propósito y también al concejal eh, Fernando Cabrera, que también está haciendo su aporte en esta dirección. And I also want to thank Councilman Rodriguez for being part of this and also Councilman Cabrera for all his help with this. Adelante. Los amigos que me antecedieron, eh, pues fueron bien explícitos en lo que nosotros procuramos. The friends who all came before me were very explicit on what we are searching for. Adelante. No vamos a extendernos porque no vamos a repetir lo concepto. I'm not going to extend it because I'm not going to repeat the concepts. Adelante. Pero Gregorio Morrobel tiene un es productor de un programa de televisión por siete años y hemos visto con preocupación la forma en que se maneja la publicidad en el estado de Nueva York. Gregorio is a producer on a TV show for seven years, and we have all seen what has concerned us about how publicity is dealt with here in the city of New York. Adelante. La comunicación no es solamente eh, los grandes emporios, como el caso de Univision, Telemundo y otros. Es donde se distribuye la comunicación. The communication is not only a place where they give information the way Univision or Telemundo does, but it's a place to distribute information for everyone. Adelante. Hay una cantidad de productores de 
programa de televisión que establecen un vínculo directo con aquellos que ven el, su programa y normalmente ese vínculo es lo que le permite mantener un contacto para eh, recibir la información. Many pro TV producers establish a straight link to the viewers, and it's this link that permits the communication to flow directly with the communities. Adelante. Ahora mismo hay un sistema que se está implementando para ejercer el voto aquí en Nueva York que tiene que ver con la selección múltiple de varios candidatos. Esa comunicación solamente se está distribuyendo en los grandes emporios de comunicación, mas sin embargo, aquí no ha llegado nada a los pequeños eh, productores de televisión y también eh, lo que elaboran periódicos. Now, today there's this system that is being brought about for the sake of the elections, for the communication of the elections, but none of the small TV producers have been able to be, have been given any kind of resources to take part in this situation in New York. Adelante. Que ya es el momento por esta iniciativa de que se inicie un propósito de descentralizar la comunicación y que los newyorkinos no importa el, eh, ¿cómo le digo? No importa el área donde vivan, le llegue la comunicación a través de los medios que ellos han seleccionado. It, it's time that this initiative starts with this purpose, with decentralizing and allowing New Yorkers, no matter where they live, to be able to obtain the information that they need. Sabemos que a partir de ahora eso va a cambiar, pero sí entendemos que en la medida que ustedes actúen en esa dirección, la información se va a multiplicar y le va a llegar con mayor y mejor contenido a los neoyorquinos. And we know that it will change, but how you all act and how you steer this into the right direction will affect how the information reaches to a multitude of populations within New York City. Este país se caracteriza por la equidad, se caracteriza por la participación equitativa entre todos los sectores. Y creemos que en esta parte había una falla y que de aquí en adelante será corregida. Muchísimas gracias. And this country has the character and the purpose of always being driven by equality and making all sectors equal. And although it has failed in this one environment, we see it that in the future it is starting to want to correct this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, at this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, Please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function, and I will ask the interpreter to um, repeat that in Spanish. Si en este momento usted no ha dado algún comentario y desea hacerlo y nos ha notado, este es el momento para usar la función de Zoom que permite uno subir la mano, raise hand, para usted indicarle a la monedora que deseas dar algún, algún comentario. Thank you. Anyone who wishes can submit written testimony for the record at testimony at council.nyc.gov. If you can say that in Spanish. Can you, what's the email again? Testimony? At council.nyc.gov. Y quien, el que desea dar un comentario, tal vez en escrito, puedes redactarlo y enviarlo al correo electrónico testimony arroba council punto nyc punto gov. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Seeing no hands raised, I will now turn it over to uh, Chair Rodriguez for our final remarks. Y como veo que no hay nadie que ha subido la mano, le voy a entregar la palabra al concejal Rodríguez para sus comentarios de conclusión. One moment.
And Elizabeth, just give me one second while I sort it out. Thank you. Councilwoman, oh, Councilwoman Diaz. Council member so I, I think he did. Council member Diaz. Give me one second, Elizabeth. I don't know why I'm, un I'm unmuted. Hold on one Hello. This year, my estimated payments come in weaker than we forecast next year because you know somebody sorry, I was having some technical issue from my end. That's no worries. We're I'm passing to you for closing remarks. Okay, then. thank you. I would like to thank everyone again. As I always say, you guys uh, from the council, you know, the tech guy, the sergeant, uh, you are the one that make us look good because we connect with all New Yorkers and also from the council perspective also, you know, you work with us in this bill. I also would like to thank, you know, Evelyn, uh, Collado, my lady's lady person. I'm also thanking to Margarita, my communication person, and Elizabeth Conforme, my chief of staff, uh, for all the job. Uh, this bill, you know, uh, will be one of the most important legacies that we will live in our city in New York. So thank you to all of you, but most important, thank you for to the publisher, all of you guys, the small one, that are, you know, small when it came to the budget, but you are so big because you are the one that connects to those on the third community, those who stay alive and providing the services to our city, especially during the time of COVID. So quiero dar las gracias a todo lo que han hecho posible esta audiencia. Para mí, como el autor principal de este proyecto de ley, junto con el presidente del condado, eh, Eric Adams, con el speaker Corey Johnson, con Oswald Félix, eh, eh, nos sentimos muy eh, satisfechos de que ustedes, los que tienen programas de radio, televisión, por 10, 20, 30 años, huérfano muchas veces de apoyo financiero de la ciudad, pero una con una determinación de seguir hacia adelante, están haciendo historia. Así que, thank you, and with that, this hearing is adjourned. Elizabeth, I see a hand raised. Can you call on the person, please? Yes, Abu Taher. Hi, so, hello. Hi, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, the, I have a suggestion, which is in order to work together and in order to, uh, you know, take a robust, uh, you know, initiative, I think that the city or city council, whatever, they can form a council 
with advisory council with the ethnic media main, uh, you know, wh whatever they choose, a panel where they can get their advice and, you know, have a meeting, uh, you know, quarterly or whatever it is. And it will be better to communicate and better understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the hearing has ended. I will.